Hi there, welcome back. Part two, an introduction to microbiology. Just to refresh your memory, I'm giving you a little bit of an overview of some of the main topics that we're gonna be covering this semester. Next on your list should be virology. And that of course is the study of viruses and virus-like entities, more on that in a moment. Uh, we refer to them sometimes as being um, acellular, meaning without cells. If you put A or AN in front of a word, it means no or not or without, uh, because viruses are not made of cells. They are smaller and simpler than even the most basic cell, which would be a prokaryotic cell or a bacterium, uh, also referred to as being subcellular, uh, reference to being below the level of the cell and not visible with light microscopy. All right, now one of the viruses that we'll be talking about is a retrovirus known as HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. It causes a disease called AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Retroviruses are a type of RNA virus that replicate their genetic information, their, their RNA molecule, through a process called reverse transcription. We'll talk more about that when we get to the section on viruses. Uh, now, if you take a look, there's a diagram of um, HIV in your outline, and you'll see two strands of RNA in the core of the virus. They are surrounded by a protein coating called a capsid. The capsid is surrounded by a uh, largely lipid layer called the envelope, and there are glycoprotein spikes that protrude from the envelope that play a role in the infection process. Now, um, this next little bit, you guys, is not in your outline, so you'll need, to, um, you'll need to add this. All right, I thought I would introduce some terminology here. Okay, we talked about this already, virus, that is an infectious agent, typically consists of a nucleic acid molecule, DNA or RNA, never both, uh, surrounded by a protein coating called capsid. Viruses can only replicate inside of a host cell. They infect all forms of life, including bacteria. Viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages. Uh, and too small to be seen with a light microscope. You would need an electron microscope to view viruses. And I already explained what the terms subcellular and acellular mean. Okay, a little bit more um, terminology. Uh, a viroid, that's an infectious agent consisting only of a circularized molecule of RNA. No capsid, no envelope. Uh, most of them are plant pathogens, but we have learned that the virus that causes hepatitis D is actually a, a viroid. Uh, and um, again, we'll talk more about that when we get to that section. It has a, uh, a relationship with another hepatitis virus, which is hepatitis B, and um, it's, it's quite an interesting relationship. Next term would be virion. Now, this term refers to a completely assembled virus outside of the host cell, and it is capable of causing an infection. So that's a virion. And prions or prions, these are infectious proteins. Now, this one's really gonna blow your mind because there is no nucleic acid at all. These are misfolded, improperly folded proteins. Uh, they cause brain infections, including things like BSE, that stands for bovine spongiform encephalopathy, also known as mad cow disease. Um, also cause an uh, infection in, um, typically we see this in sheep, but humans can become infected. The, this disease is called scrapie. And another infection caused by um, prions is uh, one called kreutzfeldt jakob disease. This is a disease that can occur, and it occurs about in um, about one in one million people worldwide. Uh, it's the result of a spontaneous mutation um, of proteins. Uh, pretty interesting. And um, another um, disease caused by a prion or a prion is one called kuru, or the laughing disease. And we will be discussing uh, these and other infections when we get to that section. Now, how do people become infected? Well, by uh, typically by ingesting 
meat from an infected animal. Uh, in some cases, people that handle infected animal tissues, um, like butchers, for example, uh, could become infected in that manner. Um, and um, uh, animals become infected by ingesting other contaminated animals. There was a problem with mad cow disease, uh, most especially when uh, some, some farmers were feeding their cattle leftover cow parts uh, ground up. It's called offal and um, added to their, uh, their feed. Uh, this practice has been outlawed. Okay, now a little bit more about the prions. Well, this is a little bit scary. I hope you sleep well tonight. They are virtually indestructible. They are um, um, not destroyed by incineration, by autoclaving, which is using steam under pressure and autoclaves um, are um, used to sterilize many, many different things, but autoclaves will not destroy um, prions. Uh, even radiation won't destroy them. So pretty scary stuff there. The infections that they cause are slow infections, meaning they have very long incubation periods, could be decades in some cases, and the diseases caused by prions are always fatal. Okay, let's move on, why don't we? Next on your outline is parasitology. This is the study of parasitic organisms, and most of the parasites that we are going to discuss this semester fall into one or two categories, either parasitic protozoans or multicellular parasitic organisms, generally referred to as the helminths. Uh, a little bit about um, a parasitic protozoan. We'll talk more about this one later, but uh, there is a protozoan named Entamoeba histolytica. It is an amoeba, which is a type of protozoan that moves by extending um, cytoplasm called uh, pseudopods. It, they sort of ooze through life. And uh, this organism is acquired by ingestion of fecal contaminated water or food as possible. And it causes a disease called amoebic dysentery. Now you've got a photograph in your notes of the trophozoite stage of entamoeba. There are two stages in the life cycle of this organism. The trophozoic stage is the active stage. That's the one that moves and feeds and reproduces and causes damage um, in its host, which will eventually result in the development of symptoms. The other stage in the life cycle of entamoeba is called the cyst. Now the cyst is a dormant stage, meaning it's inactive, <coughs> and it's surrounded by a, uh, a thick, highly resistant um, coating, cyst wall, and here's how the infection process works. Let's say an individual ingests fecal contaminated water. Now, if that water contains both the trophozoite and the cyst, the trophozoite would be digested um, as it passed through the acid of the stomach. Now, if the water contains cysts as well, the cyst wall will be dissolved as it passes through the acid of the stomach, and then the trophozoite will be released into the safety of the lower GI tract. Okay, more on entamoeba at a later date. Now, the other category of um, parasitic organisms I wanted to mention are the helminths, and these are multicellular parasitic organisms, sometimes called the worms. I mean things like tapeworms and pinworms, um, and also, um, uh, a category of helminths known as the flukes. And you have a, um, a, a little diagram of a fluke named Fasciola hepatica in your notes. The term fluke refers to the body style of this organism. As you can see from that diagram, uh, it is a leaf-shaped body and it is flattened. Um, now we'll talk about some life cycles and some diseases caused by helminths when we get to that section. Next on your outline should be um, mycology. Myco means fungus, ology means the study of, so obviously we're talking about the study of fungi. And this group is very diverse. We have unicellular fungi, those are the yeasts, multicellular fungi, lots of representatives here, um, molds, mushrooms, um, plant pathogens called um, rusts, mildew for example. Those are all examples of multicellular fungi. 
I wanted to mention briefly um, a fungus by the name uh, that goes by the name of Candida albicans. And this one is rather interesting because it's both part of our normal flora, could be normal flora of the skin um, or of the oral cavity or the uh, GI tract um, all the way from the oral cavity through the other end. And it is also normal flora of the vaginal canal in humans. Now, Candida um, doesn't usually cause problems, but if we become immunocompromised, like for example, by taking broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, antibiotics kill bacteria, not fungi. So what happens is, let's say in the vaginal canal, uh, the bacteria that also make up part of the normal flora in that area will be killed by the antibiotics and that eliminates the competition for candida albicans and it will proliferate to the point where uh, the, um, the female patient will develop a vaginal yeast infection. Now, um, candida is a dimorphic fungus. That means two shapes. And the shape or the morphology that it's going to um, take on is going to be temperature dependent. This characteristic is commonly seen in pathogenic fungi. With Candida albicans, if it is grown at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, then it will grow as a unicellular yeast. And you've got a, um, a photo of Candida growing as a yeast on Sabarod auger in your outline. Now, the same organism, if grown at room temperature, about 25 degrees Celsius, it will grow as a filamentous mold. All right, next would be immunology. And this is an extremely broad subject, but we're going to talk primarily about how our immune system protects us from infections. And for right now, I just want you to know that there are two main components of the immune system. The humoral immune system involves a specialized type of white blood cell known as a B cell. Now, when B cells are exposed to antigen, and antigen is anything that's foreign to the body, um, or we sometimes say stimulated by antigen, what happens is those B cells will undergo some further development and they will become what we call plasma cells. Plasma cells produce and secrete into the bloodstream and the lymph system protein molecules called antibodies. We'll talk about five different types of antibodies and their functions a little bit later on. Um, also, uh, the second component of the immune system is the cell-mediated immune system. Involves another category of specialized white blood cells known as T cells. There are four different types of T cells and we'll talk about what they are and what they do when we get to the immunology section. And then finally um, is sustainability. Now sustainability, the term sustainability refers to um, actions and products that meet the current needs of society without sacrificing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And when we talk about sustainability, uh, you will often hear uh, refer to what's known as the triple bottom line. And that refers to the economy, um, society and the environment. So when we talk about sustainability, we need to look at all of those different factors and um, work on um, protecting our environment, not overusing or polluting our resources uh, by um, making sure that the needs of all people on earth are met, that they have food, that they have um, medical care, that they have a place to eat. And, um, and finally, we need to develop, and we certainly don't have one right now, a sustainable environment. So what does it have to do with microbiology? Well, I'm gonna talk to you about that as the semester progresses. All right, you guys, thanks for watching. I'll look forward to seeing you soon.